project. Since the windows no are open, we're getting all kinds of extra noise. Um, I'm sorry about that, and thank you. For sure. I have a pretty loud voice. So uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming to this talk. We're really excited to talk about our Bass Connections team. So before I introduce the team, I want to set the stage a little bit. And so as was already mentioned, our group uh, had been working in Uganda since about 2007 with a very basic idea, which is we just wanted to help improve neurosurgery and neurology access and quality of care. And so that's the sort of talk of today is what we've been able to do in order to improve neurosurgery patient outcomes in Uganda. So we're going to talk about a portion of, of the work that we've done. One of the most amazing experiences, at least for me, has been working with undergraduate students on this project together. And I'm joined by three of our outstanding, amazing students on the team that I'm incredibly humbled to, that they are part of my team. They've done amazing work. A couple years ago, our meetings were at 6 a.m. For all of you students in here, uh, not many people are willing to wake up at 6 a.m. to come to our meetings. And <laughs> these students did. So just the dedication to the group and the work that we're doing. So without further ado, the three people that are going to be talking with us today are going to be Sarah Perez, who is a current uh, senior and neuroscience major and psychology minor. Sarah. And then Susanna Joseph, who is a current neuroscience major as well and chemistry minor. And then Bruno Valen, who who was with our team last year, graduated, and loved working with us so much that he decided to stay with us an additional year. I'm in his gap year, um, and he got his BS in bio. And what's really cool for us is that he also is working with the Nobel laureate, Dr. Lefkowitz, and also spends time with us working in our group. So we really have appreciated him being part of the group this year. So these three people are going to actually be part of talking about this. So my portion is going to be relatively small, because that's what this group is about. The undergraduate students actually putting together their efforts and focusing on answering this really interesting question about how do we improve patient outcomes. So just to set the stage for you all, uh, global surgery is certainly a problem that, although we talk about all these different things, there's certainly a large case for global surgery being a very important key global health issue. And so as you see these numbers, there are 5 billion people in the world that don't have access to surgical care. And if we're trying to do something about that, we need to train at least 2.2 million other healthcare providers just to provide those services. Now these numbers are incredibly daunting. So we said, let's, let's not focus on training all the surgeons, but just focus on neurosurgery. And so that's what, that's what we've done. But then you look at the neurosurgery landscape and you see that the numbers here are incredibly challenging in a way that some of the other subspecialties aren't. So when you look at this map, what this is actually showing is that global neurosurgery, in terms of the number of cases that are needed across the world, there are places where there are 10,000 cases a year that are needed to meet the demand in certain places. And so all those countries in red in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia are places where there are more than 10,000 people a year that need neurosurgery care that are not actually receiving that care. And so how do you address that problem? And so one of our... One of our one of our uh, sort of questions moving in is, so let's focus more. So again, global surgery, big problem. Global neurosurgery, also a big problem. Let's just focus on one country. So we focus on Uganda. And so when we first got to Uganda, this is what was happening. There were four neurosurgeons for the entire country. And so what that looks like is about one to six million people in terms of neurosurgeon to population ratio. Just here at Duke, we have about 25 neurosurgeons. That's more neurosurgeons than all of the East African countries essentially combined. And so we have more neurosurgeons in the triangle than you have in a, in a wide swath of Sub-Saharan African countries. So we decided to think, how do you do something about this? So how you do something about this is, a first step is, how about train more people? Train more people to become neurosurgeons. And so that was our first step. Our first step was, how can we train more neurosurgeons that are Ugandans to become neurosurgeons? So that's what we did. We established a residency program in 2009, and this is, there's, this is still, there's still a lot of way to go, but we've trained six neurosurgeons in the country already that's graduated from our residency program. There are more people, neuro, neurosurgeons, who are now staying in the country because there's now neurosurgery access. There's now more people. There's a neurosurgical society of Uganda where all the neurosurgeons in the country have band together to sort of lobby and advocate for neurosurgery in Uganda, which is now cause there to be about 12 neurosurgeons spread across the country, which has reduced the ratio almost in half to 1 to 3.5 million. 
So that's a success. <laughs> but at the same time, there's a there's an incredibly long way for us to go. Now, when you take that first step of improving the number of neurosurgeons, a question that you have to ask yourself is, what's happening to patient care? Patient care is going to be the most important thing that we need to worry about. And so one of the first studies that we did was we looked at what is happening to patient outcomes. So I spent some months digging through every single neurosurgery patient that had been operated on in Uganda for the past 10 years as a way for us to understand what happened before we came and then what was happening now to neurosurgery patient outcomes, looking at basic things like infection rate, how long people are staying in the hospital, number of surgeries, complexity of the cases, all of that. And what we found is that we increased the number of neurosurgeons, but our view in some ways was a little bit too myopic in the sense of we were focusing on training neurosurgeons and forgetting about the fact that you can not you can do a good neurosurgery case, but if you don't have everything around them to take care of those patients, then those patients aren't going to do well. So although we went in and said, oh, we expect the patient outcomes to be better, they weren't, and then we had to take a step back and think, why not? And the reason for that comes down to the fact that there are a lot of health system factors that are causing these barriers to patient care. And the word that we're going to talk about today around this is just perioperative management of patients, which means preoperative management of patients and postoperative management of patients is what was causing these neurosurgery outcomes to not be what we were expecting. So we developed an approach. We said, let's not just focus on training neurosurgeons, but let's talk about how do we look at the entire care spectrum? So when a person gets injured all the way to them go to the hospital and then they leave, what can we do to evaluate that from a research standpoint? What can we do to intervene at those different steps? And so this has been our approach is looking at what we're calling the continuum of care for neurosurgery patients. And so this is our approach out in our division about how we think about this problem. Now, when we look at the challenges that we face that led to the team, there are some key things in, that really led to us developing our fast connections team. Number one, medication adherence was 40%. And I know that I'm biased about neurosurgery, but neurosurgery patients need their medications in order to make sure that the outcomes are good. You can't do a neurosurgery case and not be able to and not be able to adequately take care of their intracranial pressure. You can't do a neurosurgery case and not make sure that that person doesn't have seizures after this really complex tumor case that you've done. So patients not taking their medication is leading to severe impact on their outcomes. The next thing in this setting, and this is this, the case in a lot of sub-Saharan African countries as well, is that a lot of what we would consider nursing care is happening with the patient's families. And so patient's families are having to feed, administer medication, and other tasks that they don't have the full sort of education on how to do that. And that leads to sort of certain things that happen in the hospital. And then lastly, this number is, this number is daunting in a way that some of the other numbers aren't. 35% was the infection rate that we found in Uganda when we first got there for any patient. So you come into the neurosurgery ward, about a third of patients would end up having an infection. And so you see these three problems and we said, let's, let's throw a bunch of undergraduates at this problem together. <laughs> and so we got the Bass Connections team together and we put three sub teams together in order to address this. So we have an infection control team, a patient caretaker education team, and a medication management team. And so that's what we're gonna to talk to you about today is how we've put together undergraduate students to, in these small teams to go after and try to solve these three issues that we have. And so without further ado, the question that we're gonna talk about today in these three groups is how can we address this? How can we address these health system challenges in a contextually relevant and a culturally appropriate way to improve patient outcomes. So the first person is gonna be Sarah Perez who's gonna to talk to us about what we've been doing in patient caretaker education. Um, so hi, my name is Sarah. I'm a member of the patient caretaker education team. Um, and so basically this team's goal is to address barriers to health education of patient caregivers. Um, like Tony was previously saying, um, there's a shortage of nursing staff on the neurosurgery ward of Malago Hospital, so a lot of the care falls to patients' family members. Um, the problem is that they have a limited knowledge about many basic healthcare practices, and this is leading to fatal mistakes in medication administration, feeding practices. So our goal is to improve the education of these patient caregivers and to increase their knowledge of these basic healthcare practices. 
Um, so the very first year that this team was in place, our goal was to identify, okay, what are some of the key barriers and needs for caretaker education? Um, so in order to do this, we conducted a few surveys of family members, staff, and the patient caregivers in order to see like um, what the main problems were. So we conducted some basic demographic information, like what are some of the main, the main languages spoken on the ward, um, and then also some more qualitative and subjective interview questions, um, such as what are some of the main tasks performed by caregivers, um, and how many caretakers are there per patient. Um, and so in analyzing this data, we determined that one of the key problems um, in the caregiver um, education was improper feeding techniques. And this was leading to a lot of complications with choking and aspiration because a lot of patients on the ward have to be fed using a feeding tube. And this is a kind of a complex process that a lot of patient caregivers just don't know how to do properly. So this was leading to high aspiration rates and choking and death. Um, and an additional problem was that there's a lot of overcrowding on the ward. So there are two to three caretakers per patient and just like managing all of their education is just also a huge barrier. Um, so in order to address these problems, we developed a combination of different interventions um, one of which was an SMS text reminder for patients um, to turn for patient caregivers to turn their patients. So um, a lot of the patients in the neurosurgery ward are immobile and they can't move themselves. So they require constant turning in order to prevent any bed sores, um, which are a major cause of infection and death. So what we did was for a two-day period of time at two-hour <coughs> intervals, we sent um, patient caretakers text messages reminding them to turn their um, patients in order to try to prevent bed sores. And so we kind of um, compared the frequency of turning during this two-day period to an original baseline to see how effective it was. Um, and then one of the other interventions we did was develop a poster showing proper feeding techniques um, in order to prevent aspiration. So we focused a lot on using pictures and visuals, and also we um, made the poster in many different languages in order to try to reach as many caregivers as possible. Um, and then the last one we did was an employment of a patient educator to educate patient caretakers on patient care practices. Um, and so the impact of these interventions were that we found that there was a 1.78 times increase in patient turning rates during that two-day period of time in which they received text message reminders in comparison to the original baseline. 70% um, of staff reported using posters in educating caretakers. And there was a greater than 90% satisfaction rate with the health educator um, of people who responded to the survey. Um, and so then this past year, um, we kind of switched up the focus of our goal because um, we had a specific request from the hospital um, to create an educational video showing proper feeding and care techniques. So the hospital staff decided to buy a TV and they wanted us to write, direct, and film a video um, showing sort of just proper feeding and care techniques um, so that the patient caretakers can have a really visual, just like this is exactly how you need to do this um, up on the ward plan for them to see. So the topics that we covered in this video were how to feed with an NG tube, how to normally feed your patient, um, how to do like proper hand sanitation techniques, and also just the dangers of overcrowding in the ward. Um, and we had a script in three different languages too, um, Uganda, Swahili, and English, um, to try to reach as many caretakers as possible. Um, and so now moving forward, um, due to requests from the IRB board, we are gonna switch our focus from educating <laughs> caretakers to educating nurses. So what we're hoping to do is implement an aspiration risk training program um, for nurses in the ward that will kind of just teach them how to identify patients that are at a high risk for aspiration. Um, and it's based off of a screening tool that was developed in South Africa. Um, so we're hoping to, yeah, just help um, identify patients at a high risk for aspiration. And we're not exactly sure how this is going to move forward, but um, we hope to implement a use of a screening tool um, in the neurosurgery ward in order to identify patients at high risk for aspiration, and then maybe nurses can sort of like pay more attention to them, oversee their feeding, um, and stuff like that. And the training will be done by a nurse educator that we're gonna hire. Um, so yeah, those are some of our plans moving forward and past interventions for our team. I'll now turn it to Susanna for medication management. All right, so hi, my name is Susanna, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the medication management team. Our main goal is to increase medication adherence um, in the patients. And so an example of something that is impeding this adherence rate is the treatment sheet that you see up on the slide. And it's very complicated and difficult to interpret, and so that can lend to confusion <laughs> for the caretakers in terms of when to give the patient specific medications or what medications to be giving the 
patients. So before I delve into that, I kind of want to give you guys a little bit of a general overview of what our team first did when they got on the ground. So they wanted to elucidate the problems that the neurosurgery ward in Malaga were going through and those problems that were causing medication, lack of medication adherence. So they found that there was about a 40% medication adherence in the neurosurgery ward, which roughly matched what the previous literature has said for the internal medicine ward at the same Malago hospital. They also found that this could be due to a variety of external and internal problems. And so the main external problem that they found that factored into the lack of medication adherence was just a lack of access to the essential medications that were prescribed to the patient. However, the biggest internal problem that they found was patients' poor understanding of medications. So this poor understanding caused <coughs> patients to not fully comprehend the importance of taking their medications and the value medications had in their healthcare regimen. Additionally, the team found that the high rate of patient caretaker turnover exacerbated the problem of an already confusing medication regimen. And so that led to the caretakers not fully being aware of when they were supposed to be administering the oral medications to their patients. So the team elucidated two big problems that they wanted to impact. The first one was a poor understanding of the medication purposes, and the second one was a complicated medication regimen. So for this first problem, they decided to employ an information sheet. So basically, they split the general categories of the medications that were being prescribed in the neurosurgery ward into four main categories, and they discussed the purpose and the side effects for each of these four categories. The second intervention to tackle the complicated medication regimen that they employed were pill boxes to just help patients better organize all of their pills because previously the way it was organized was they were all just in this paper bag, which I'm sure as you can imagine, a bunch of white pills all muddled together in a paper bag can lead to a lot of confusion over which medication to be taking at what time and on what day. So they found that the pill boxes were actually incredibly effective in increasing the medication adherence in the ward. And interestingly enough, they also found that the pill boxes improved patient understanding of the medication purposes, which doesn't really make a ton of sense. But what they found was that when the pharmacist, Dr. Winnie, was giving the patients their pill boxes, she was also talking to them a little bit about what the purpose of each medication was. And that oral information proved to be much more effective than the information sheets that the team had passed out. And so the reason we think that is, is because of the high illiteracy rate in the ward. Um, however, the pillboxes did have problems of its own. Pillboxes were very difficult to upkeep, so you needed someone to consistently put the correct pills in the correct little slots on the pillboxes, which took, was a, it was a really big investment of time. Additionally, the pillboxes led to confusions regarding the correct time patients were supposed to be taking the medication. Because of the way pillboxes were designed, all medications for a given day were in one slot. And so patients who had to take a medication three times a day were often taking it at 10 a.m., noon, and 2 p.m., as opposed to eight hours apart, like was prescribed. So we took this information moving forward to this past summer, and we really wanted to focus on designing an individualized treatment sheet, because if you guys remember from a few slides prior when I showed you what the treatment sheet looked like, it was very difficult to comprehend. And also, this treatment sheet was not a treatment sheet that stuck with the patients. The nurses and the physicians were the ones who had that treatment sheet. So the patients and the caretakers didn't have any sort of documentation that clearly showed the medications that the patients were on, as well as the dosages that the patients were supposed to be taking. However, this idea turned out to not work because we wanted it to be easy to fill out for the patients, but for us to include all the information that we wanted to originally have, it led to a very crowded sheet, and so we felt that that would confuse the patients more. And so we tried to workshop it, with the various members of staff on the ward, but we decided to pivot 
and focus on the same ideas and just apply them in a different way. So the two things that we really wanted to focus in on was conveying the purpose of the different medication categories to the patients, and we wanted to convey the correct times that they were supposed to take each medication. So we decided to play off of what Dr. Winnie was doing when she was orally talking about the purposes of the different medications, but instead have pharmacy students do that because the pharmacist, Dr. Winnie, had a lot of jobs that she needed to do, and so we didn't think it was extremely feasible to have add another extremely time-intensive task for her to do. So we worked with pharmacy students, and their job was right after rounds, they would go and individually meet with every single patient, and they would color code their medications with stickers. And these colors would correspond to the colors that you see on the um, far right poster that had the different categories of the medications laid out. And so that would help convey the purposes of the medications in a much more visually appealing way. We worked very closely with the hospital's medical illustrations department to design this poster in a way that we thought would best convey the meanings of it. The pharmacy students would also answer any questions patients had about their specific medication regimens, and they would write down the specific times patients were to take each medication on the boxes. So all the information was right there, very clear for the patients to have. So we measured the impact of this over the course of a week, and over the course of a week, over 275 stickers were placed on the medication. Caretakers understood about 77% of medication purposes, and caretakers knew the correct time to administer 83% of the oral medication. Once we left the ward, these patient consultations by pharmacy interns continued to happen about two to three times a week. There are six posters detailing the purposes of the various medication categories placed around the ward, and there's also, we put in an analog clock on the ward so that Caretakers knew what time it was, so they knew the correct time to administer their medications to their patients. However, we are now currently working to further improve these patient consultation sessions. We think that the biggest issue right now is that these consultation sessions are very time intensive. It takes about two hours for a pharmacy intern to complete an entire ward. And what we think is happening is that the pharmacy interns are focusing on placing the stickers on the medications as opposed to writing down the specific times of the, the patient needs to be taking the medication. So what we have decided to do is take out the sticker component of the consultation session and move that information to a general ward education information session where the pharmacy intern is going to hold up the poster and just generally talk about the five different purposes of the categories of medication. And this, we are hoping, will free up more time for the pharmacy intern to focus in on writing down the exact times they are supposed to be taking every single medication and answering questions that patients could have. So thank you for listening, and now I'm going to hand it over to Bruno, who's going to talk to you guys about the infection control team. Thank you, Susanna. So, like she said, uh, my name is Bruno Vallon, and I'm going to talk to you about infection control. Uh, what I want to do is to walk through the evolution of our project and how each project iteration built off the previous year's work. Um, and I'd also like to talk to you guys about uh, some of the challenges we faced, uh, some of our successes, and uh, the things that we've learned. So, uh, before I dive into uh, this slide, I just want to point out this picture up here of uh, what was the only sink uh, on the neurosurgery ward when we, when we initially got to Milago? And um, I'm going to talk more about the resources on the ward later, but I just want to point out to you right now so you get an idea of what it really looks like to be on this ward. Um, so as Tony talked about, um, when DGHI first got to the Milago National Referral Hospital, um, the intervention primarily focused on uh, building surgical capacity. So we saw an increase in the case of the number of cases and surgical complexity uh, that was done on the, uh, at Mulago. But what we also saw was increasing infection rates. And the inception of this team was really catalyzed by those increasing infection rates. Um, and a lot of uh, hand hygiene literature indicates that uh, one of the easiest and most effective ways to address uh, nosocomial infection rates um, is by improving hand hygiene. 
Uh, and this really became the first target of our team. Um, so our first year at the MNRH, what we wanted to do was to establish uh, kind of baseline data and to figure out what were the barriers to proper hand hygiene on the ward. And uh, like I pointed out in that slide before, as you can see, there really was a large resource gap, making it unfeasible to have proper hand hygiene on the ward. Um, in addition, uh, we discovered through gaining local perspectives that uh, attitudes of local staff towards infection control practices were also a potential barrier. And uh, in part, these two things could contribute to the uh, overall low level of hand sanitization compliance and also high level of infection rates. Uh, so during the first, the first year, uh, what we sought to do was to improve sanitizer accessibility and visibility. And uh, we did this by uh, basically putting up wall-mounted pumps spaced evenly in between the patient's beds. Um, and also adding posters to the walls of the ward that indicated proper hand sanitization techniques. Um, and while these efforts uh, did increase the overall usage of hand sanitizer, uh, we didn't necessarily see a similar rise in hand sanitization compliance. So the next year, we focused on improving and testing our intervention. And we did this by adding new pump modalities to the ward. Uh, and so what this looked like is we distributed mobile pumps uh, to the staff of the neurosurgery ward, and also uh, installed bed-mounted pumps to the foot of the patient's beds. And the idea here was that by installing these new, new modalities, we would make it a lot more practical uh, for patient caretakers to sanitize before and in between patient interactions. Um, we collected data during this time on uh, the daily mass of gel that was used at, from each pump type, uh, and we also got data on uh, patient interactions and pump usage uh, of both staff and non-staff patient caretakers. And our results at this point were actually pretty encouraging. Uh, we saw that by adding these new pump modalities, we were able to once again increase the global amount of uh, hand sanitizer that was used on the ward. And, and we also actually saw that the bed-mounted pumps that we installed uh, were used significantly more frequently uh, than any of the other pump types. So at this point, uh, we kind of thought we were going in the right direction. We had something that kind of worked, but um, this was actually when we hit our, our first biggest struggle. Uh, and this occurred when the Bass Connection students returned to Duke uh, over the year. And uh, it turned out that a lot of these new pump modalities that we had installed over the summer were not maintained. So they were either lost or broken or in some other way uh, misplaced or displaced from the ward. Um, and we really had to take a step back and figure out how we were addressing sustainability in our project, which was difficult because it felt like we were really close to a potential solution. Um, the following summer, uh, we were lucky enough to have a really talented alumni of our project, uh, Sam Sadler, travel to the Milago National Referral Hospital on a BASS follow-up grant. Uh, and she was actually able to establish a locally based Milago neurosurgery infection control team. Uh, and she also helped them structure guidelines uh, to identify new areas of uh, protocol and project development. And since then, the infection control team has actually focused on collaborating <coughs> a lot more closely with them uh, to, to build more locally driven protocols. Um, in that vein, this past summer, uh, the infection control team spent a lot of time discussing uh, the feasibility of future interventions and ones that could be more readily maintained over the year. Um, and through these discussions, uh, one of the things that we really saw the staff talk about was the need to decrease urinary tract infections. Uh, and this became the focus of our next and most recent protocol. Um, so uh, through further collaboration and uh, also our own rigorous review of the literature, uh, we have decided to um, focus our next project on optimizing the use of urinary catheters, which actually really lends well to what we were doing before, trying to improve hand hygiene, because as you guys can all imagine, proper hand hygiene is one of the most uh, important and essential uh, aspects of proper indwelling urinary catheter use. Um, so currently we are developing this uh, bundled protocol that will focus on, uh, on urinary catheters. Um, now, while that is exciting in itself, what I think we think is the most important development of our project that kind of came from the struggles we had uh, is actually a change in the way that we communicate with our local collaborators in Lulago. Um, 
And this fall, uh, we actually spearheaded an effort to engage in a systematic and standardized method of communication with the local team. Um, so we now exchange bi-weekly updates uh, that are specific uh, to what we're trying to, to the protocol that we're trying to do. Um, and one of these uh, consistent updates is we now receive an updated map of pump function and location every two weeks. So we're able to maintain an understanding of what the available resources are on the ward. Um, and uh, we also are receiving regular input from the staff on the current catheter-focused protocol that we are developing. Um, and we're really hopeful that you know, this effort uh, to approach global health through a more uh, bilateral exchange of strategies and mentorship uh, can really inform our most effective uh, and competent intervention yet. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Tony, uh, who's going to talk about some of the cumulative impacts of this really half-decade year's worth of work. So I want to take a step back to talk about what I said at, at the beginning. This, this topic of how do you improve sort of neurosurgery outcomes is an interesting question. And as you see, a lot of what we're doing is what would be QI projects, a quality improvement thing. And so it's all about quality improvement in the hospital, looking at what are the things that are causing the issues that are happening, working with the local staff, and trying to develop an idea of how do we address that. And each year, it's like, what are the next things? How, how can we continue to build on this quality improvement? And so all this work, which has so many different components, different facets, different approach styles, has had significant impacts. And that's what I'm going to share with you. But what I wanted to do is we came into BAS with a very specific strategy of how we wanted to engage our undergraduate students in the work that we were doing. And so each year, we had a specific focus on what we were trying to accomplish. So the first year, was really just trying to, we had gotten the numbers and we had established a database, a registry. Right now, that's been ongoing since 2015, capturing every single patient that is operated on in the neurosurgery ward at both of the hospitals. So we have this continuous monitoring mechanism that allows us to understand what's happening to patient outcomes. But we still needed to understand, we know these problems, infection is high, medication adherence is, is low, we have this problem with healthcare literacy. What do we do about that? So the first year was really a lot of understanding the problem, doing sort of all the mapping of like, what are all the issues? Let's, let's lay it out, let's map out this, and let's develop strategies. The next year, we actually developed interventions, testing them out. And this is like a fail quick scheme, like develop something. If it doesn't work from a quality improvement perspective, think about why didn't it work? What can you gain from that information? Use that to develop the next strategy. And so these first two years were iterative processes of developing interventions that we thought might work with the locally based staff, giving their input and ideas into them, but then testing them out for some period of time, using our database to help to see, is that actually impacting outcomes? Seeing qualitatively from people's experiences what's actually working, what's actually not. Throwing away things that they said, we can't sustain this, and moving on and saying we failed and just, well, let's do something else and learn from that experience. And, that has, and that's what we did in 17 and 18, is, is iteratively developing this intervention. Now, when you go back to these problems, you also have to have, and what we did this past year as well, is think about, we need to have some targets in mind as well. We can't just say, infection is 35%, we want it to be zero. <laughs> because one, that's not feasible. And, and two, you, you need to have a stepwise approach to how are you going to measure the impact of what you're doing against that. So setting some targets. And so right now, that's what we've been developing. What are our targets for this? What do we want medication adherence to be in the next year? What do we want healthcare literacy, which is a hard thing to qualitatively or even quantitatively understand healthcare literacy? And then infection rate, what do we want to happen with those targets? And then our broader goal is how do we uh, sustain this? How do we sustain this quality improvement? And as Bruno mentioned, Developing on the ground team that actually is focusing on quality improvement projects has been one of the really amazing developments that we've been able to have. The neurosurgery infection control team in Uganda meets without us and talks about what they're seeing. They bring ideas. We talk together about what can we do. We provide resources if necessary for them to be able to do their own projects and then use some of that information in our undergraduate team to develop projects based upon what they want from us. This all helps to make sure that we're always moving forward with trying to improve outcomes. And so shifting to the sustainability. 
I love all the undergraduates on my team and bringing them over to Uganda. That's not a sustainable method for improving outcomes 15, 20 years from now. Developing the culture of quality improvement in the hospital is what's going to do that. So some tangible things that have happened from all of this work that we've done. So from a literacy standpoint, we have so many more educational materials that are on the board that has really helped nurses to be able to have something to actually point to when they're talking to, to caretakers to say, please watch this video in the language and be, able to under, and be able to use those techniques to pull off some of the burden that nurses have of having a one to 20 ratio. I can't spend this all of this time talking about you know, proper feeding, but please watch this video. So we have all these educational resources, which if I go all the way back to the photo that's beautiful, that shows the nurse actually using it, talking to a patient uh, caretaker and pointing to the photo, uh, the poster that's up on the wall. And that's what you see um, happening in the ward when you're on there to a day-to-day -day basis, of which I just was in Uganda two days ago, and they were doing this. And the video is in the ward play. Medication adherence. When you look at medication adherence, we it's been hard for us. For those of you who want to look at medication adherence, it's a hard, <laughs> hard topic uh, to figure out. I do pill counting, all these various things that are hard to measure. But what we've directly seen is that patients understand their medications more. <laughs> patients are getting their medications more than they were um, before. And all of this has increased an understanding, at least, of taking their medications. And again, that educational material, having something that directly shows this is how you're supposed to take your medication. This is an easy way to identify. And then lastly, infection rate was 35%, preoperatively and postoperatively. Over the course of this time, we've been able to get it all the way down to 4.5 to 10% in terms of fluctuating over the months. Now, that's an, inc I mean, of all the things on here, all of these things are incredible. This is, this is something that has the most, the most direct numbers that we're able to show. But this is an incredible change in terms of the number of infections that's happening and, and has really improved the overall outcomes of the neurosurgery patients. And so all of this is this partnership with undergraduate students, me throwing some small ideas, and us working with the folks in Uganda to actually do this and have these tangible impacts in the ward. So what I, what I wanted to share, and I love this as an additional impact of working in this and for all the faculty and other folks in here that have vaccination teams are thinking about it, being able to have undergraduate students working on these projects has been amazing. And these are just all the people who have been involved over the course of the year. And what I love is that we, we've been able to have these amazing experiences of going to Uganda, having really good discussions about the ethics of global surgery, about how do we approach this, how do you actually do this bilateral exchange in talking to your partners, where you should come back home and be talking on WhatsApp all the time with them, not, I'll see you in six months to check in on what's going on um, in terms of your project. It's constant communication. And then it's allowed for people to use that and then to progress to the next stage. So there's lots of folks in the team that have gone on to medical school. Um, there's The folks in blue are all people who stayed here um, to go to medical school. Um, and so it's just been beautiful to have all these students you know, participate in this and then use this as a, as a way to understand how do you really think about approaching these really complex global health issues and, and, and have that approach um, as they move forward into their own careers. And there, what's not on here is all the people in Uganda that we've been working with over the years that have contributed to this project, where it's now, they're excited for the undergraduate team to come. They are asking me, when are you all coming back? What are we doing next um, to, to focus on improving outcomes, um, which has been beautiful. And so with that, we just want to say, Thank you for listening to this talk. I think it allowed us to present what we're currently doing. There's a lot of quality improvement, which is the main focus of this, but then also this impact on the students as well as on the, the patients has been the most important and rewarding thing for me. And what you see here is us in our white coats doing work and, and hanging out with, with the people in Uganda, and then a picture of us also doing some group bonding, going on safaris, hanging out as a team um, when we're in Uganda as, a, as another component of actually understanding and being sort of integrated into communities doing global health. So with that, thank you all for listening and we're willing to answer whatever questions you may have. Hello. Um, thank you. This was wonderful. A question though, and you might have addressed this. <clears throat> 
very early established that there's this huge neurosurgery deficit in East Africa. What was your basis for choosing Uganda specifically? Was there like a prior connection you had there? Or was it arbitrary? So, so uh, Dr. Highland, who started this work, um, actually, it, the story is essentially there's a pastor who came to his church here and said, this is your mission. Like, God is calling you to go to Uganda to work there. And so in 2007, that's what he did. So he went to Uganda on sort of the advice of this pastor, saw what was happening on the ground, uh, and then started developing the strategies, which was initially just training neurosurgeons, bringing over equipment, going and doing operations. Um, this is just a facet of our overall division, but that's what sparked this division, is that a pastor coming here and saying, please, you need to go to Uganda. God is calling you to go there. And Dr. Agland picked up that call, and that's, that's how this started. Uh, great presentation. Thanks, Tony and the team. Uh, you mentioned the bilateral exchanges. Can you expand on that a little bit? Like, What level of staff or professionals are you communicating with on an ongoing basis? And in particular, uh, to what extent do you engage with the very kind of frontline caregivers or caregiver, caregivers, like the nurses in the earliest stages of defining the, the priorities, the needs, barriers, and potential solutions? Yeah, so to that point, our, our group actually tries to engage at all of those levels. So everyone in here, if you look at their WhatsApp, they have a WhatsApp chain with the actual nurses on the ground that are taking care of the patients. Um, the pharmacist, as was brought up, Dr. Winnie, is communicating with them. The pharmacy interns, who are the people actually delivering the content, they're on WhatsApp communicating on that. And then at a, I guess at, what do I want to say, at, the, at my level, I, I then work with the director of the neurosurgery ward. I talk to the director of the hospital. And what we've done is use this as also like a incubator for ideas. I mean, the neurosurgery ward has been able to do stuff that other places in the, in the hospital haven't in terms of improving infection and, and other things. And they've been able to use some of the stuff we've done in the neurosurgery ward to apply it to the broader sort of Malago hospital. And so by talking to the Infectious Disease Institute, by talking to the overall Malago neurosurgery infection control team, by talking with the pharmacy folks that are controlling the, the rest of the hospital dynamics, we test out ideas that they then try to, to take other places. So there's multiple levels of communication I'm in our team, and we try to make sure that the students are most directly connected to the people who are actually taking care of patients. Thanks. Yeah, going back to the uh, initial question about why you chose Uganda. Um, compared to other countries within the East African region, uh, would you think that uh, Uganda is particularly more, more problematic in terms of uh, the poor patient outcomes and uh, in neurological surgery? So, so I've been to a lot of the other East African countries, and what I can what I can say is that when it comes to neurosurgery and neurology in this space, I would say there are certain countries that are slightly ahead. So Kenya has a lot, a lot more neurosurgeons in the country, has more training programs around that, has a more well-established sort of COSEXA residency program there. But when you look at the issues that are causing the problems of the number of neurosurgeons, the people being in only the main cities, and so the patients who are in the more rural areas are not able to receive these services, and then the health system factors that are causing all these patient outcomes, they're, they're pretty similar when you look at Uganda versus Tanzania versus Kenya um, versus Rwanda. All of these places are in a slightly uh, similar spot, which is for us, what we try to do is we talk to the folks that are working in those different areas. We've been very focused on Uganda trying to do what we would say is like a, a test case of trying to do these ideas that help to improve neurosurgery and then have these communications that allow these other, these other places that are surrounding to also build again off from what we've been learning to improve neurosurgery in those other spots as well. So that's, there's, again, there's no, specific, I guess, specific reason why we're staying in Uganda other than that initial thing, but we're trying to continue our focus and not divert our interest to lots of different places in order to make sure that we're actually improving things in Uganda before we move on to other places that have similar issues. So you investigated Uganda purely for, for convenience purposes? Not convenience purposes. It's to the, as I said, the point of, this is a calling. Um, for Dr. Hyman and for me personally, I, I joined the team. So I, I joined the team because I, I really care about this topic, 
And I I live in Uganda five months out of the year um, for the past essentially six years. And so I this is this is now my family of people there. And so I now I'm connected in that way in terms of the that environment that's been there. I'm actually exploring the scientific basis for your choice of Uganda. And, and the, um, there's, no not sci- really there's no scientific basis other than it. it's another it's another location that has the same deficits in East Africa. Okay, so mine is actually, I wanted to find out from you, the, there is of course shortage of manpower in Uganda. So how are you able to manage the, these uh, achievements? in the context of the scarcity of manpower that usually happens in, in African countries. For example, nurses are scarce, uh, in, uh, doctors are also scarce. So when you say every two, two hours a patient has to be turned, that can become problematic in the sense that there are other patients that need to have attention. So how are you able to navigate these uh, challenges? And then my second concern is, uh, what were the mechanisms that you put in place as you are living? So that this kind of interventions remain sustainable, you know, in the long run. Yeah. So to the to the first comment, that intervention was for caretakers. So it wasn't a task that nurses had to do in terms of turning the patients. And so again, that was a direct message to the caretaker who was already taking care of the patient, who's always at the bedside, for them to turn the patient. So we're always, as I said, there's a one to twenty ratio when it comes to nurse to patients. And so you have to consider that in all of these interventions, and, we, and we've done that. All of the things are trying to improve or reduce this, I guess the level of work that are, are required for nurses to help to offset this ratio, and then seeing how can we shift some of the things to the caretakers but make sure that we're improving their education as a lot so they can actually do some of those things effectively that they're already doing. Um, to the second point about sustainability, it goes to all of these conversations that we have um, with the folks in Uganda are based upon how can we make this sustainable? What are the ways to ensure that the things that we're doing are going to last and build it into the culture and environment? I think one of the things that has really been beneficial to this is that the head neurosurgeon for the ward is the person who helps to make to pitch all of this out. And it's not us going in and pitching that we're going to be doing these things. He leads this effort. He says, this is now how we're taking care of patients. And that allows it to be sustainable. We're just a, we're just some of the manpower that helps to implement it, and then they find a way to sustain it and bring other manpower in to make sure that it moves forward in the future. So here and then. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, but as um, a neurosurgeon myself uh, from Nigeria, um, the picture you painted um, is also familiar. Um, even though our own uh, indices may not have been as uh, poor as um, it was in Uganda uh, before the intervention. Um, and in addition, we've um, also been able to implement uh, some of the um, techniques that you've used, uh, patient care, uh, caretaker education, um, health worker education, and then um, literature, providing literature, and then attempting to improve <coughs> medication adherence. Um, now, my, you were able to measure the um, improvement in um, infection rates, the drop in infection rates from 35% to um, about 10%. Um, is it not possible to also measure uh, the improvement in uh, medication adherence and uh, patient caretaker um, education? Um, I don't know, it may be challenging given that it's not the same patient that is there all the time, you know, but then uh, in terms of um, asking the health workers themselves, and then um, considering the amount of literature that was there initially and then um, the amount of literature that is left. But in terms of literature, it's really quite uh, challenging being that the fact that literature is on the wall doesn't mean that it's in use. You know, it could just be there and people could take it and, um, you know, without really uh, reading it and applying it. Certainly. So I think to those two points, we so each year we've tried to develop new ways to actually measure those two topics. So we've done that. So we just didn't present the information about the medication adherence. We've done how often are people actually using the posters? How often are people doing X, Y, and Z? Um, there we were we're still trying to figure out a way that's again from a sustainability perspective and something that can be continuously collected. How do you measure healthcare literacy? 
in a way that's effective other than coming up with these qualitative metrics that we, we have those. We have those of how, how many, how, how much more frequently are they actually using this? How often do the nurse educator go around and actually talk to the individual patients about the different topics? We have all that information, but it, it hasn't, it's not a direct correlate to health literacy, which is the topic that you're asking. Now, medication adherence. Now, that topic, we every single year, we've gathered data on it. What's been hard from a whole host of things is what is the what's the denominator that you're using for medication adherence? Is it every single medication of which 70% of the time patients don't actually have all the medications that they're, they're prescribed? How do you do proper pill counting or IV administration? How do you come and collect all that data? So it's a very it's become a really time intensive data collection process, which is why we focus on both of those. What is the shift in education? What's the shift in material resources? And we're, we're, we would love to come up with a standard way to, to measure both of those things, which we're currently thinking about, but we haven't come to something that is actually feasible on the ground. I'm curious on the hand hygiene uh, aspect. Uh, CDC still recommends hand washing as the leading and best way to prevent transmission. <coughs> Only use of sanitizers if water is not available. So was that was the availability of running water uh, an issue there? It was. Yeah. So, and sorry. Yeah, it was. It was something that we uh, have tried to address um, uh, by initially actually trying to put in these mobile uh, hand water pump washing like pedal stations. Yeah. It wasn't something that the local staff was as receptive to as uh, trying to get uh, some of the sinks on the board working. The thing about the sinks is um, there's only one, and to put in another one would require a much larger kind of like infrastructural intervention on the plumbing. And uh, another big thing is trying to put these uh, sanitizing stations in places where they are convenient for people to use immediately before and also between patient interactions. So you can imagine if there's one sink at the back of the ward, it's going to be a lot. Uh, le it's going to be a lot harder to uh, you know go back to the sink, wash your hand between every one of your you know patient interactions during the round on the ward. Yeah, and I just want to point you all to this picture. So it's a diagram that makes it look very organized. <laughs> and then on the ground, this room is the room for the entire neurosurgery ward is smaller than this room, and there's 50 patient beds in it. And so 50 patient beds and then trying to put any kind of, as we were just talking about, a stand that you can, you can press and there's water and you can wash your hands there is not feasible. Even putting a sink, you're going to have to make a choice. I need to take out three patient beds in order to put that sink there. Um, and so that's a decision that hasn't been made. And then when you look at this, what, what's important is that, so this is a neurosurgery ward. You have to go outside into the nurse's station to go to that sink. And so that's the sink that you can use to wash your hands. And I think while we recognize that, the question was, what is the next best thing that we can do to actually improve infection control? And although, as you said, and we understand that literature, that hand washing is the most effective, you also have to say, what is most practical? What can actually be used in this setting? And so that's why we chose the hand sanitization. But we have been talking to the architects and have talked about how can we actually think about placing running water in the ward, which would replace some of the things that we've been doing in order to make sure people can wash their hands. Thank you. Is it possible for us to see the video that you created? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we have that. We can show it. Put over there. Sorry. I'm hiding behind the pillar. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you very much for an interesting presentation. I'd particularly like to congratulate you on the very nice looking slides. Well done. And this this picture uh, right here is also very interesting and, and nice. Um, my question was uh, relating to something you mentioned right at the end where you said that the uh, mechanism for doing or the method for doing quality improvement was something that had been picked up by hospital leadership and, and potentially implemented in other uh, wards. So I was wondering whether there is any thinking around how this could be something <coughs> that uh, uh, could be taught or conveyed to the hospital more broadly and maybe be implemented for general surgery or infectious disease or any other ward uh, in the hospital or elsewhere in Uganda, I suppose. So, uh, I think our main strategy at this moment has just been 
collaborative discussions with those other units, but no direct, like, we're going to talk about our approach and, like, go and talk about how do you develop this quality improvement strategy, although it's certainly something that we could do um, in the future. It's just at this moment, it's, it hasn't been our approach to, to do that. We've talked to all these different departments, and, I mean, Luanda is relatively small in terms of the communication between all of the different areas, so there's that open communication, but not direct. Like implementation in some of these other places, but it's obviously a great idea. Thanks, Tony, and an amazing presentation and four years of incredible work. I just want to go back to your first slide about the care continuum and just getting a sense of where you are thinking about building bridges. So similar to Hampus's talk, uh, comp, to these other sort of locations that impact on. Um, the morbidity, mortality, the number of incidents, those sorts of things. Any thoughts about that, or you can go from here? Yeah, so I think, so that question is, way at the beginning. Mm -hmm. that, that question is outside of this group's, I guess, mission and task, mm -hmm. but when it comes to our broader division, we are working in that space. And so when we, when we look at how do you take care of neurosurgery patients, we recognize that, one, we're never going to be able to train enough people in order to take care of the burden. So one of the things you also have to think about is how do you prevent some of these things from happening? How do you prevent some of the occurrences of patients having traumatic brain injuries and having to come to the hospital, having antenatal and prenatal things that are causing patients to have hydrocephalus, having some of these CP issues that come with, you know, uh, antenatal care in order to prevent some of those things from happening. So when we look at the pre-hospital stage of this, what we look at is how do we understand what's currently happening with road infrastructure? How do we understand what's happening with boat to boat drivers either wearing helmets or not? And for all of you, boat to boat is our motorcycle taxis that take patients. Sorry, take, not patients, they become patients. They take, <laughs> take, take people around town. Um, and sometimes they wear helmets, sometimes they don't, and they get into accidents, and it's the largest contributor to traumatic brain injury in the country. And so we talk about how do we look at helmet usage, how do we look at um, those things as a way to prevent traumatic brain injury patients from coming in, working with other strategic partners in the country who are actually working on developing a pre-hospital EMS infrastructure to get patients to the hospital sooner. So we partner with a lot of different groups to focus on that. We also then do research in those different areas. We've done nationwide uh, epidemiology studies, understanding what is the occurrence and burden of traumatic brain injury across the country from a health system perspective, doing a full country, every single healthcare facility examination of what's currently happening with a neurosurgery referral system and pattern. So if you go to a healthcare center two in a rural location, where do they then send you? And what's happening with that referral system that could be improved? And then how do you then place people to at, across all these facilities that have maybe not the full spectrum of neurosurgery capabilities, but can at least do a traumatic brain injury, can do a myelomeningocele case, which is a relatively straightforward operation um, in order to improve the access and quality. So our group, this is this is this presentation is very specific to in-hospital outcomes, but our group and our division overall looks at all of those as a way to improve the overall care for neurosurgery. That is all the time we have, so thank you all so much.